bit. So my name is Noble, and I started the 360 movement a while back, about a, a year and a half ago. And I, because I love learning, I, I love I'm, I'm telling you that is I love love learning. And so I thought, well, man, and I've been growing myself on a personal professional development uh, growth aggressive growth process for a couple of years now. And so I thought, well, man, if I love personal growth, maybe there's some other people that love personal growth as well. And so I started the 360 movement a while back. And so every couple of months we do seminar. There's big Rian. Rian, good to see you, man. I can't wait. Okay. <laughs> good to see you too, bud. Hey, guys, awesome. how you doing? So can't, can't wait to, to introduce him. Let me give me one second here, Rian, and I'll, and I'll introduce you. I'm Thank kind of you. sharing the, the background, the context there. Um, so every couple of months, I do do seminars on uh, on different areas of life that are that are, I feel are big rocks of life. So the 360 movement, it kind of a, the 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 analogy is for me. I saw a lot of my my friends and classmates. I have very you know I went to West Point, so I'm an old grad. A lot of my classmates are are o, o sixes colonels and stuff with some lieutenant colonels, and then I've even got a, a general classmate who's a who's putting down his first star back in October. And uh, no, actually, no, 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 a couple months in July. So he's been a general for a little while now, a few months now. And, and here's what I've noticed. So I've, a lot of, I've seen a lot of people that are financially successful, but are not family successful. I've seen a lot of people that are professionally successful, but not personally successful. Well, you know, my, my faith background, I'm a Christian and you obviously, you can be whatever faith background you are. But for me, I wanted to be successful in every area of my life, not just one area. And so that's what kind of started me on this whole 360 movement with, you know, that's kind of our approach to leadership and growth is growing in every area, not just one area. And I just, I've met a lot of friends of mine that are zillionaires that are on their second and third family. And for me, that, that, that was not, that didn't excite me or that didn't inspire me. Um, and then I've also met some folks that have some amazing families but eating ramen noodles and I didn't want that either. So, uh, so I wanted, again, a, an approach, you know, kind of that, that was all encompassing and so, boom, that kind of was the, what started the, the 360 movement. And so, I, I, one of my jujitsu instructors, actually, a guy named Quast, Jason Quast, uh, black belt in jujitsu, amazing dude, amazing guy, also a special forces soldier, uh, senior NCO, non commissioned officer in special forces, said, Hey, nobody, you got to read this book, The Rise of Superman. I'm like, oh, I'll check it, I'll check it out. Because I love reading, I read a ton of books. And so, finally, 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 it took months and months and months, but finally, I picked up this book. And as soon as I picked it up, I'm like, oh my goodness, I just got, because I've been an entrepreneur now for 20 some years. Lots of businesses, part, been a part of probably close to 10 different startup businesses and stuff. And, and I love performance, right? I love, I want, you know, and, and to, not to, to, I'm not trying to preach to you guys, but there's a biblical reference, Matthew 25, 14, and 30, talks about. Um, the, the, uh, the boss who gives one of it, there's three, three employees, one employee, five, five talents, another one, two talents, another one, one talent. The first two employees doubled his money by the time he returned. And I thought, man, I want to double the investment that God's made into me and impacting as many people as possible. My personal mission statement to positively impact millions of people for the kingdom of God, to positively influence the influencers, to raise the next generation, to be patriotic world changers, to love the Lord, to God, to their heart, mind, soul, strength, and body, and to help hungry people identify and pursue their purpose in life. That's my fivefold mission statement. The 360 movement, we want to change the world by changing your world by changing you. And how we do that is by reaching the world, restoring brokenness, empowering leaders and influencers, affirming gifts, strengths, talents, and superpowers, cultivating deep roots, harvesting long lasting legacy fruit. And so boom, back to this rise of Superman, it talks about the, so boom, here it is, the rise of Superman, it's a few years old, decoding the science of ultimate human performance. Well, in, in true creepy form, I'm reading this book and somehow Facebook somehow knows that I'm reading this book and I see one of Rian's ads, right? Just happened to see this presentation on flow and friction. And I'm like, what? I just, like, I'm in the middle of this book right now. There's like how in the world, who knows all the creepy cyber stuff that goes on. But anyway, somehow it knows that I'm reading this book. So I'm reading this. So, so I watched this, this presentation of that Rian did on, on Facebook and, and I was mesmerized, absolutely mesmerized because of, again, this concept of flow and friction and being an entrepreneur, I know I have times where I'm very, very productive. And I also know I have a lot of times where I'm a complete train wreck, right? And I'm like trying to, you know, count my 10, you know, fingers and toes. Like, am I still alive? Like what's going on here? And I feel like a complete basket case. And so when this, this, again, this reading this, this 
the book and Maureen's presentation on flow and friction, it like it completely made sense to me. There are times where, in fact, I've just listened to a podcast by Stephen Collar right now, who's the author of the book, Rise of Superman, on uh, uh, selflessness, effortlessness, and timelessness. That when you're in the zone, when you're in the flow in a flow state, those three things kind of kind of take place or kind of factors in in, in, the, in, in that scenario. And let me just read something very briefly before I introduce Rian to you guys. So check this out. This is from the book Rise of Superman, and this guy is a mountaineer. He's a, he's a high speed mountaineer guy, and he wrote a book called Bone Games. This is one of his his quotes here: "Being in a, in a flow state that occurred while mountaineering is utterly transformational." Oh the person, the person I became was the best possible version of myself. So here's the deal. As business owners, as entrepreneurs, some of y'all are homeschoolers, some of y'all are military professionals, military NCOs, officers, maybe, maybe uh, uh, enlisted guys. How important is being the best version of yourself at, in those areas? It's critical, right? So uh, uh, I should have been, okay, so I was the best possible version of myself, the person I should have been throughout my life. No regrets, no hesitation. There were no false moves left in me. I really believe I could have hit a mosquito in the eye with a pine needle at 30 paces. I couldn't miss because there was no such thing as a miss. It didn't matter whether I fell or not because I couldn't fall any more than two plus two can equal three. When doing what we love most transforms us into the best possible version of ourselves. And that version hints at even greater future possibilities. The urge to explore those possibilities becomes feverish compulsion. Intrinsic motivation goes through the roof. Anyway, so I wanted to share that, that little excerpt from you guys from the book, Rise of Superman, because it is absolutely amazing. And I feel, again, it's critical to, you know, again, if you want to accomplish, you, you believe God's got big plans for your life and you've got big goals, big dreams, I feel like operating in that flow state and, and, and being strategic with friction, right? Because that was another thing that was fascinating about Rian's presentation was that there are some areas of your life where you want friction. I want friction in the areas where I have bad habits, right? I want friction. I want as much friction as possible. I didn't think about that. I never even considered that. So, so, so and, and then I want less friction in the areas where I'm trying to change the world in. I want less friction in those areas and I want more friction in the areas that hold me back. Anyway, so, and I've had a couple opportunities to talk to Rian. He's a super dude. Um, you'll tell from his, from his super cool accent, he is not, it is not from Texas. <laughs> he, is from, he is from Ireland and, uh, and has been part of the, he is a chief growth officer for the Flow research collective so they have a whole a whole system a whole program which at some point i love some of us to go through together uh, would be my goal but a whole program on how to help people high achievers high performers become the best version of themselves so let me give you the quick agenda so ryan's going to give about a 30 minute uh, keynote presentation on flow friction whatever he's going to talk about and and that's for everybody and then we're going to take a little quick break and then, then we're going to have a Q&A just for those that are vetted 360 influencers that have been part of a two-month-long vetting and selection process. So that's, that's for the 360 influencers. So, so it's going to be um, 30 minutes, then a break, and then just for the 360 influencers, a Q&A. So, Rian, thank you so much for taking your time to invest into the 360 movement, into all these folks that are hungry to grow and learn, and I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thanks for having me, Noble. Appreciate it big time. And uh, that was a great intro. You're getting me pumped up as well there. <laughs> and good to see you as well. And uh, hello to all you guys there as well. Nice to see everyone online. Um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to do, uh, and you can let me know, Noble, if this, if this sounds okay. But what I was thinking made the most sense is to actually go into some different content, some different advice to the webinar that Noble mentioned on friction because that's available. You guys can all watch that afterwards if you'd like. So, you know, there's no point doubling up. Um, so what I wanted to do was kind of start with just a little bit of background on, you know, myself, our organization, and then flow and what we're actually talking about here. We use that term and what it is, what it feels like. And uh, then we're going to touch on the research, if that's okay. I just want to kind of show you guys what it says or, or what the research looks like with respect to flow. 
And then I'm actually going to get into a very, very practical, kind of surprisingly straightforward um, evening and morning routine that I think will be very useful to everyone in it, just as you know, straight up practical takeaways. Uh, nothing kind of totally magical, but you know, the sort of straightforward, simple things that are not easy to do that most people don't actually do that really do make a difference. So that's what I was thinking structure wise. That sound okay to you, Noble? That sounds excellent, Rena. Just to kind of give you an idea again, if, if, if I'm not sure what, at what point you jumped on, we've got a lot of military folks, uh, officers, and non commissioned officers, um, civilians, business owners, entrepreneurs, homeschool families. We got a lot of so that's kind of our and some business, you know, some business folks as well. So, um, so anyway, that's our audience. So that that I love. That sounds exactly. I think that would add value to everybody. On that'd be amazing. Thanks, Rian. Super. Yeah. No worries. And that and that kind of the way we try and keep a lot of our content is not sort of overly specific, so that it can be generally applicable. So they're kind of more they're more principles than specific techniques. Um, but I can touch on some techniques as well. But. Just to dig in then, guys, firstly, big thank you for having me. Uh, so my name, as Nobles mentioned, is Rian Doris. I'm Irish, hence the accent, and I'm co-founder and chief growth officer here at the Flow Research Collective. And so the Flow Research Collective is a research and training institute. On the research side, we partner with different academic institutions, and we conduct research into the neuroscience of peak performance. And our overarching research goal is to decode the neurophysiology of flow state or peak performance. In more simple terms, what that means is actually just finding out what is going on in your brain and in your body when you are in a flow state or when you're performing at your best. And we're currently partnered with Imperial College London, UCLA, USC, UCSF, and lots of different other universities and institutions like Deloitte and Formula One doing research into that topic. So trying to understand what's actually going on when you're in that state so that we can more effectively train people to be able to get into that state of flow. And then on the training side, we use evidence-based neuroscience backed interventions and protocols with executives, entrepreneurs, athletes, and creatives to help them improve their performance and output. And that's what we're going to be doing with you guys today. Um, and, as far as a little bit more background around who we've worked with, we've actually worked with the U.S. Naval War College, for you guys who are involved in that side of things. We've worked with people like Goldman Sachs, Cisco, and Google. And at this point, Stephen has trained over 20,000 people formally and then given keynotes to well over 100,000 people on these topics. Um, but what I, what I want to start with is just what flow actually is, because you know it's a very colloquial term. It kind of is often used or can be used in many different contexts, uh, but I want to kind of, you know, get a shared understanding around what we actually mean by it here. So flow is defined as an optimal state of consciousness, a state where you feel your best and you perform your best. And it's definitely something that, you know, all of you on the line here have experienced it at, you know, one point or another, and you may have referred to it as being in the zone, as getting into a groove, as getting in state, as having a good rhythm, potentially as you know, having or building momentum, but that state is flow. And that's the technical term that's used within academia and within the scientific literature around this stuff. And the term was coined by a Hungarian psychologist called Mihai Csikszentmihalyi in the 1960s. And the reason he called it flow is because when you are in a flow state, things literally feel flowy. I'm just going to give you kind of a description of, you know, what the state feels like. And as I do this, I want you to kind of think back on your life and see if you can resonate with this. And if you can think of examples, potentially, you know, even within the last week or this morning uh, where you, you felt this state. So the term refers to those moments of rapt attention and total absorption where you get so focused on the task at hand that everything else disappears. Action and awareness merge your sense of self vanishes so that kind of you know that inner critic that voice in your mind that monkey mind that's constantly nagging you actually quietens down and your sense of time distorts so oftentimes with cognitive work that you're doing so you know kind of focused work that's mentally challenging time is going to speed up and you'll kind of lift your head up from the computer and not know how long you've been sitting there and then it turns out you're actually sitting there for two and a half hours but throughout being in that state, all aspects of performance, both mental and physical, go through the roof. 
So feel free to write into the chat if you can kind of you know, resonate with times when you have been in that state of total and utter absorption and immersion in whatever it is you're doing with the rest of the world kind of melts away. Because that's, that's the state that we're referring to when we use the word flow. Um, and so in terms of the research around flow, there's a ton of extremely impressive performance benefits and enhancements that are associated with the state. And the reason that we focus on flow as an organization is because it's the pinnacle of peak performance. There's over half a century of research that we're going to just touch on now that kind of helps validate that claim. So just to give you a super quick breakdown of the research, just a few highlights. McKinsey, the management, consultants, uh, management consultancy, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, found that executives in a flow state are 500% more productive than when not in a flow state. That means, you know, technically you could go to work on Monday, spend Monday in a flow state and get the same amount of work done as your steady state peers do in the entire rest of the week or go into work and spend Monday and Tuesday in a flow state and be, you know, doubly effective as the competition. And I know that sounds hyperbolic and, and, and extreme and we'll touch on why it's a little more challenging to actually pull that off in a second. But that, that is what the research says. Uh, so and then research done by Teresa Amible at Harvard. She's a psychologist at Harvard. She found that creativity spikes from three days after a flow state. Research done by the University of Sydney found that problem solving increases by 430% during a flow state. And research done by Advanced Brain Monitoring in DARPA, which some of you guys also may know, found that when snipers are in a flow state, and we can kind of extrapolate that out into the population more broadly, that skill acquisition speed, which is a fancy way of saying learning, increases by 490% when you're in a flow state. And I know Nova mentioned the importance of learning and, and flow significantly enhances learning for a number of kind of scientific reasons that we're not going to be able to go into today. Um, and so James Slavic from Greylock Partners in a recent article at Forbes coined flow state percentage as the most important management metric of the 21st century. And what that is, is simply the amount of time employees are spending in a flow state. And if you're an entrepreneur, you know, you can apply that to yourself. It doesn't necessarily need to be employees alone. So, you know, the point is that flow is extremely highly correlated with a lot of critical performance outcomes. And I'm sure, again, when you think back to times that you've been in flow yourself, you, you know, are aware of that just anecdotally. It's kind of common sense. You know, that's the state intuitively that people are trying to get to most of the time during their work days. You're always trying to get into the zone. You're always trying to get fully focused. You're always trying to eliminate distractions so that you can slip into that state and experience the performance enhancements that come with it, even if you didn't know that, you know, flow is a technical term and that there's this whole body of research around it. People are always trying to get there, whether they kind of know about it or not. Um, and so one thing I just want to mention to sort of taper down that, uh, that kind of excitement a little bit is that the challenge here is actually being able to get into that state consistently. Because for most people, flow is elusive, it's sporadic, it kind of randomly happens, you get into that zone, you don't really know how you got there, you get out of it again, you don't really know how to get back there. And, you know, being 500% more productive or being able to learn, you know, 400% faster is not actually going to make a huge difference to real business outcomes if it only happens for, you know, 45 minutes a couple of times a week. So the key, the real key is being able to get into that state with consistency and work towards spending the vast majority of your workday in that state of hyper focus and flow. And that's when you do see the, move, the, the needle really start to move. That's when you start to see real impact. And that's what we do at Flow Research Collective is we teach people how to train flow so they can get into that state with consistency. And so what I'm going to touch into now is just a super practical kind of evening and morning routine that is going to help with being able to recreate that state of flow with consistency so that rather than just kind of randomly hoping wishing or praying that you're going to be able to focus and get into flow you actually have some very simple practical tools that are going to increase your likelihood of being able to get into that state so i just want to do a quick check-in before jumping into that content does that all that all make sense and, and sound okay to everyone amazing 
Amazing. Okay. Loving it. Absolutely. Super, super, super. Alrighty. So again, as I mentioned at the start, you know, a lot of the, the funny thing about all this is that a lot of the training that we do and a lot of the protocols and habits that you need to get into flow are deceptively simple. And this is where most people go wrong. They think because things are simple, that things are not valuable and that things couldn't significantly move the needle, but the magic actually rests in doing the simple things consistently and not underestimating the power of simple things. And, you know, just because it's that, like that kind of old trope, just because it's simple does not mean it's easy either. So what I'm going to go through here is what we call the power down ritual. So that's your, that's your evening routine. Um, and then a flow hacking protocol, which is what you can do in the morning. And if you have, for any reason, the inability to be able to work in the morning, you can kind of uh, customize this uh, flow hacking protocol for a block of time later on in the day, potentially actually even evening time, and then you would still do the paradigm ritual afterwards. So if that's the case, just try and try and take this content on with the context of your own life, your own situation, et cetera. And as I mentioned, we try and keep these things more to principles so that you can play with them a little more yourself rather than you know being stuck if, if it doesn't fit exactly with your life. So just to, to do a quick uh, overview on what we're gonna go through. So first thing is the power down ritual. And uh, there's three steps to that. The first one is prioritization. Second one is gonna be defining clear goals. And then the third one is going to be tuning the challenge skills balance. So that's the power down ritual. Uh, and then for the flow hacking protocol, first thing is gonna be minimizing cognitive load. Second thing is gonna be leveraging the flow cycle. And the third thing is going to be minimizing attention residue. So let's start now with the, with the paradigm ritual. So you're going to want to do this at the end of your workday. And it may seem like this is a lot to do or a lot to add on, but you should be able to do this whole thing in less than 20 minutes. And the amount of value it will give you is, you know, so, so far beyond that time investment. So step one is just going to be prioritization. And this involves identifying what we call your MITs or your most important tasks. These are the tasks that, you know, if you do that day will make your day a win. So you want to get really good at identifying these tasks. These are the kind of tasks that you actually need to do to guarantee that you're making real progress towards your primary goals and objectives. So your most important tasks, the things that if you do, your day is going to be a win and you'll have actually moved forward, not just kind of done busy work and sort of been busy all day, but not really progressed. And that's the problem is a lot of people spend their time trending horizontally, which is what we call it, kind of oscillating within, within the realm of maintenance mode. You know, they wake up, they do kind of busy work, they respond to emails, they get reactive. Uh, and they kind of get put on other people's schedules and then they finish the day without having done anything like that significant or real that has tangibly moved them forward. So we wanna avoid that as much as possible. And so what you're gonna do, super simple, at the end of each day is just review your big objectives. You may have five year goals, you may have a year goal, you may have quarterly goals or a sequence of those. Ideally you have all of them and they're kind of you know, feeding into one another but you want to do the equivalent um, at the end of each day for the next day. So you want to sit down, you want to review your biggest goals and you want to define exactly what the one to three things that you can do the next day are that are going to move the needle the most or that are going to guarantee the most progress if you complete them. So these are the things that you know, if you get these done and you go to bed, you've done nothing else, you feel content, you feel satisfied, you know you're actually moving forward. So we simply want to identify these things between one and three, definitely no more than three. And then you want to jot them down or track them in your calendar or whatever kind of, you know, basic sort of task and management tools you use. You can just literally write them down if that's the way you like to do it. So that's step one, prioritization. And that's identifying your MIT. Step two is going to be defining clear goals. And so just to kind of go back into flow research for a second here, um, Clear goals is what's called a flow trigger. And so flow states have certain triggers or preconditions that arise before the state itself. And these are things, these are drivers that propel us into flow. 
So you need these triggers or preconditions to be in place before you can actually get into a flow state. And anytime you do get into a flow state, whether you're aware of it or not, these triggers have been in place. And there are psychological triggers, environmental triggers, social triggers, even creative triggers, different categories of triggers. There's 21 in total. And we want to harness the power of these triggers and we want to build our life and our work practices around these triggers as they're the key to unlocking flow. And clear goals, which is step two in the power down ritual, is a flow trigger. And it's one that we're going to be leveraging. So what does clear goals mean with respect to your MITs? Because this ties back into to step one, which is prioritization. So we're going to actually, we're going to take our MITs, which we've defined in step one, and we're going to add clear goals to them. And so just to give a little more background, clear goals is a psychological trigger and it's pretty straightforward. It's knowing exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. When your goals are hyper clear, and we're not talking about year long goals, we're talking about the goal within a specific task. So a goal within your MIT, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you what that actually looks like in a second. But when goals are clear, the mind doesn't wander to what it may need to do next or what has to be done in order to begin a task, it just knows. And that allows you to focus and allows you to funnel your focus into the present moment and for action awareness to begin to merge and for you to begin to get into flow. So the next step here is to line up each of our MITs with clear goals. So this means getting ultra specific about what exactly needs to be done within each of the MITs or the most important tasks and then we want to gather up everything that's needed in advance of doing one of those tasks. So I just want to ask Noble, if you can give me an example of a task that a lot of you guys do frequently that may be an MIT, and I want to just give you an example of what this would actually look like. That's a great question. Um, let's say, I think for every, for every business owner, entrepreneur, I would say, um, and even in the military, but networking, connecting with other people, I would say is a major, a very critical task that, uh, yeah, that, that we all need to get better at. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So let's say, let's say, you know, you're wrapping up work and you know that one of your, one of your most important tasks for the following day is going to be to connect with, um, six people. So that, that sounds specific. It sounds already like it may be a clear goal, but that's going to be one of your MITs, but that, that does not have actually the level of clarity that you need in order to be able to get into flow. So rather than just having the goal be connect with six people, the goal or that the task should be far more specific than that. So it should be just for example, and you, you ideally you want to literally write out these steps as clear goals within that task of connect with six people. You want to write out, you know, number one is open up CRM or customer relationship management system or whatever the case may be. Number two might be, uh, you know, reach out, to 24 contacts with you know this piece of value that we're giving them um, and number three maybe follow up with x other people so that you know you know that having by having done those three more specific tasks you're going to hit your your bigger goal for the day of connecting with six people so all we're trying to do there is we're trying to take our, our specific tasks for the day and make them hyper hyper specific and what that does is it eliminates procrastination in a very strange way. So, you know, you think that you've got a clear goal to connect with six people, but then you start your work day and you're not, you're not a hundred percent clear on what the first move actually is there. And by just going to a whole new level of clarity and making it, you know, absolutely foolproof and kind of easy as hell, the kind of thing that you can just follow without any level of thought, even if you were exhausted, you're actually able to trigger flow much more effectively because no real thinking is needed. You just, you have your main task and you have the hyper, hyper specific tasks within the main task of like the next steps that need to be done in order to be able to execute that. Um, and that is going to help you get into flow more quickly. It's also just as a side effect going to stop you from procrastinating because what it does is it actually eliminates or reduces what's called activation energy. And activation energy is essentially the amount of effort that needs to be put forth in order to be able to accomplish something. And when you eliminate the cognitive effort that's required to be able to figure out how to accomplish a task by just writing down the micro steps, you reduce the activation energy, you make it much easier to begin immediately, and your brain knows, because you've literally thought about it in advance, exactly 
what needs to be done. So you can almost kind of switch off part of your brain, which is what we're trying to do to get into flow and just mindlessly execute the tasks that you've set up the night before. Um, so that's, that's going to be clear goals after the MIT. So just to recap that really, really quickly, make sure we're tracking and clear here. Uh, step one is going to be defining your one to three things that are most important. Step two is going to be adding clear goals to each of those three things, because even though that seems like you're already putting clear goals down for the day, they're not usually going to be clear enough. So you want to get microscopic with the detail that you're adding into exactly how to accomplish each of those MITs or most important tasks. Does that make sense so far? Super. Amazing, Rian. We are loving this, man. This is <laughs> Good stuff. This Good is stuff. Awesome. So, <laughs> that's great. That's great. And it's shocking how much of a difference this makes. And I just, if it's okay, I wanted to actually just give one more example just so we're really clear on exactly please, what this looks like. Please, that was incredible. What's that? Yeah, please do. Give okay. another example. That's super, great. Super. So let's just say, so I, I do a lot of that, uh, and I don't know if you guys do this kind of thing, but I, I write a lot of marketing copy. And, you know, oftentimes my most important task for the day, so my MIT will be, you know, finish sales letter. So it's finish sales letter and then to, to follow step two here and add clear goals to it, what I want to do is, uh, you know, write down on paper or wherever it is that I do my kind of tracking at the end of my day, I want to write down that, you know, step one under finish sales letter is open up the document that I am going to write the sales letter in. Then maybe let's just say, for example, in order to complete the sales letter, I need to download an image that someone has sent me in my email that I need to put in the sales letter. I want to do that the night before, before I begin the task. So that kind of micro task that I'm not fully clear on is actually done. And then I want to put the image in the sales letter and get it out of the email. So you just kind of like, it's almost like cleaning things up before you start the main task. And then let's just say that, you know, the third thing I have to do, the third kind of loose end before beginning this primary task of writing the sales letter is um, logging into some platform and gathering data around how much I'm going to say the product that I'm selling costs. I want to also do that before in the evening, before the next day when I'm going to do the main task of writing the sales letter. Then, you know, I wake up in the morning and I have the document open where the sales letter needs to be written. The image is in there. The details from the platform that I had, had to log into are in there and everything is 100% clear, 100% ready to execute upon, and there's no open, uncertain, loose ends, because that is what kills people with procrastination, the ability to get into flow, is having these big tasks that they're clear on, but then they're not clear on what they need to do within the tasks. So you wanna try and eliminate all those loose ends, eliminate all that uncertainty, get microscopically clear about exactly how to execute any of those big tasks. So I think that's clear for everyone at this point now. Um, so then step three in the power down ritual is going to be tuning the challenge skills balance. So at this point, you've got your most important tasks defined and mapped out with the clear goals. Um, and now it's time to take advantage of another of flows triggers. And this one's called the challenge skills balance. And the challenge skills balance was also pioneered by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the Hungarian psychologist. And it's the idea that flow sits, so a flow state exists right in the sweet spot between boredom and anxiety. And again, if you think back to times in your own life, you'll be able to resonate with this. So if a task is too easy, you actually drop down into boredom and it's just mundane. It feels slow to do. It's painful. But if a task is too challenging, it actually triggers anxiety. It triggers procrastination. You get freaked out. You're not able to fully execute upon. So in order to be able to get into a flow state most effectively, the challenge level of your task should be just slightly above your current skill set. If it's too far above your current skill set, meaning the task is too hard, you're going to be triggered into anxiety. And if it's too low below your current skill set, you're going to be triggered into boredom. And the thing is just going to feel like a pain in the ass and boring as hell to do. So you've got to have your work be just a, the, the perfect level of difficulty, just more challenging than your current skill set. And so that might sound a little bit, you know, hard around how to actually like, how do I make my work the perfect level of difficulty? There's just certain bits of work that I have to do. I can't choose all of it, but there are actually ways that you can tune the challenge skills level. 
or the challenge skills balance. So you can artificially make your work easier or harder so that you're kind of hitting the sort of the sweet spot there um, between boredom and anxiety and being able to trigger flow. And so I just want to give you one super simple example of how to tune the challenge skills balance that you can apply to this evening routine, the power down ritual. So super, super simple. Um, so let's say that you have a task that is super boring, mundane and easy. What you're going to want to do for the following day in your, when you're scheduling your tasks into your calendar is give yourself less time than you thought you would have needed to be able to accomplish the task. And that is artificially making the task more challenging because you're forcing yourself to do it in a contracted or shortened period of time. And that's going to make it more challenging and lift you up out of boredom and into ideally the sweet spot between flow or between boredom and anxiety. And, and the inverse is the exact same as well. So let's say that you've got an incredibly complex, difficult task uh, and it's just overwhelming and you've been procrastinating it. What you want to do is the exact opposite. You want to block out far, far, far more time than you thought you would have needed for it on your calendar. So let's say, you know, you kind of think roughly it's going to take you two hours, block out six hours and, and guilt free six hours. And what it's going to do is it's actually going to decrease the challenge level of that task simply because you've got more time and resources to be able to allocate towards it. And that's also going to kind of bring you down from anxiety. And again, into that sweet spot between boredom and anxiety, which is where flow exists. That's where we find flow. Um, so that's a super, super simple way of tuning the challenge skills balance to get it to the optimal point so that you can get it to flow. And that comes just after you've defined your most important tasks, you've added clear goals to those most important tasks. And then when you're scheduling, which you want to do anyway, you want to be scheduling these tasks onto your calendar the next day. You want to assess how difficult they are. And if they're easy, then give yourself less time than you would anticipate they require. And if they're super challenging, give yourself more time on your calendar than you would anticipate that they would require. And you're going to find a significant difference there in terms of being able to get in the flow just because of the pace you're going to have to work at. So that's the power down ritual. Um, so step one was prioritization, identifying your most important tasks or MITs. Step two was defining your clear goals within each of those MITs. And step three was tuning the challenge skills balance by making things have less time if they're easy and more time if they are difficult, which is gonna get you into the sweet spot for flow. So I just wanna check in, Noble, on how that's all kind of being received so far and uh, how we are time -wise. Oh, where we are eating this up, Big Rian. This is awesome, <laughs> bro. Loving this. <laughs> Great. That's good to hear. Okay, sweet. Do I, do I have time to keep going then into the... Uh, Absolutely. Into the morning routine? Okay, super. Super. So that's, that's going to be our power down ritual. That whole thing should take you no more than 20 minutes at the end of your day every day. Uh, and then what we're going to do next is we're going to go through a quick three-part uh, ritual or routine again for the morning. And this one is going to be your flow hacking protocol or your flow priming ritual, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, what we've done in the evening is we've kind of set ourselves up to, to be in, in a sweet spot to be able to do this morning ritual, but it's during this morning ritual or morning routine that we're going to want to be actually getting into flow. So the, the evening routine is not, you know, it doesn't matter necessarily if you're in flow or not while you're doing that. But here, this is where we're gonna have our main flow state for the day, ideally over kind of a two to three hour period. And I'm just gonna walk you guys through exactly how to make this happen. So as I said, this is gonna be a call to flow hacking protocol. Step one is gonna be minimizing cognitive load. Step two is gonna be leveraging the flow cycle. Step three is going to be minimizing attention residue. And so first one is minimizing cognitive load. So what the hell is cognitive load? So cognitive load is the amount of information that you are holding in your working memory at any given time. And cognitive load, you know, essentially is the amount of effort that you're spending to keep things in your memory at any given time. So think of it like this, you know, your brain has to use a computer analogy, a fixed amount of RAM. 
And the higher the cognitive load, so the more things you're keeping in your memory, your working memory at any given time, the more RAM is being taken up at any given moment. And the less power or focus that you have available to be able to direct towards whatever it is that you actually want to be focusing on. And again, just to make this super simple, you know, you can relate this back to simple things in your own life. So if you're trying to remember, you know, 30 things on a to-do list, um, you're going to have, you're just literally going to have less mental power or capacity or processing power, whatever way you want to describe it, to allocate to whatever it is that you're actually trying to do. So you always want to keep cognitive load or the amount of things that you're holding in your working memory at any given time as low as possible. And I'm going to go through a couple of super simple ways to do this. So the kind of golden rule to minimize cognitive load is twofold. First part is to cut out anything that's going to cause you to think about anything else besides the work that is in front of you. And number two is to add anything in that is going to help you to only think about the work in front of you. And so just to kind of make that contextual, uh, we're going to be, I'm kind of, I'm thinking about this in respect to your morning routine. So you're waking up in the morning, let's say you wake up at eight o'clock um, and let's say you're going to have your main kind of work block where you're going to accomplish the three most important tasks that we've defined the night before over, you know, a three to four hour period between, let's say, nine o'clock in the morning through to, you know, midday or one o'clock kind of thing. So we're, we're talking now about your sort of your morning before you're going to do your three most important tasks. And I'm just going to kind of restate and go the rule to minimizing cognitive load within that context. So first part cut out anything that's going to cause you to think about anything else besides the work in front of you, meaning your three most important tasks, and add anything in that is going to help you to only think about the work in front of you, meaning your three most important tasks. And so our power down ritual has taken care of the second piece there. So our power down ritual has been the adding things in that are going to help us only think about the work in front of us because we've prioritized, we've set our clear goals, we've got all the thinking and uh, clarity that we need to be able to execute on, upon those tasks. So in the morning, now what we're going to be focusing on is cutting out the things that are going to help, that are going to cause us to think about, you know, things other than the work in front of us or the three MITs. And there's two main ways that we can do this, or at least that I'm going to touch on here that we can do this. So the first thing is going to be automation. And that the, I touched on a lot of this on the, uh, the webinar on friction, the Nova Watch, which you guys can check out afterwards. And step two is going to be digital and distraction management. So step one, automation. What we want to do in the morning is we want to automate as much as we possibly can to minimize decision making and cognitive output requirements. So ideally, you want to do things like having your outfit or whatever you're going to wear for that day set out the night before. Or what I do, I actually only wear black, which is actually just a super handy hack um, that stops me from having to make decisions in the morning. I just wake up, all my clothes are black, everything matches perfectly. I just throw on whatever and it can't but match. Super handy. But if, you're, if you care about your style, you know, a simpler thing is just to lay out your clothes the night before. Same thing applies to breakfast choice. Ideally, you want to have your breakfast choices made the night before. I, just, I don't eat breakfast in the morning either. I just drink coffee and take some supplements, um, which is very simple and handy. But if you do eat a big breakfast, you want to decide on what that is the night before, or ideally you just eat the same breakfast every single day. But essentially what you want to do is every single step that you take from waking up in the morning through to sitting down to doing your three most important tasks that you've set out the night before should be automated. It should be predetermined so that there's no decision making required. The last thing you want to do is wake up in the morning and then decide, do I work out now or do I eat or what do I wear or do I go meet a friend? All that stuff should be absolutely eliminated. You should have an extremely clear set of specific tasks that you execute upon mindlessly between waking up and sitting down to do your three most important tasks. So same breakfast, you know, outfit selection done the night before, every single step predetermined the night before, or just, you know, set and forget rules in general, like me only wearing black or picking one breakfast that you always only eat. So that's number one, automation. 
for minimizing cognitive load. Uh, number two for minimizing cognitive load in the morning is going to be digital and distraction management. And this I think is actually even bigger than, uh, than automation. This is just key. It's super, super simple, but again, no one does it. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to eliminate ruthlessly, and this is super important if you want to be able to get into flow, any distraction in the morning. So email, phone checking, reading the news, consuming information, unless it's reading or it's, you know, reading maybe part of one of your MITs if it's high quality you know, knowledge that you're taking in. But any, you know, feedback or news feed scrolling on Facebook or Instagram is a disaster. So you should ideally eliminate all incoming information until after you've done your three MITs. And I know a lot of you guys, you know, networking is a big priority here, but unless networking is one of your MITs and you can kind of dig in specifically to certain emails for that, that might be okay. But in general, what you want to do ideally is literally keep your phone off um, and protect yourself from all incoming information until you have accomplished your three most important things for the day. So I keep my phone off to lunchtime every single day. Um, and a lot of people think that, you know, they're going to miss out on big opportunities or that, you know, some fire is going to go on in their business and they're not going to be there for it. But in our experience working with over 20,000 people in this, those fears are massively overestimated. Usually nothing happens and the gain in performance and productivity and your ability to get into flow is massive. You know, and ideally, often those, those kind of fires that crop up, those employee issues, have a magical way of taking care of themselves when you are just not available, when everyone knows that you are just not available as a set rule. Shit just gets taken care of. It's kind of bizarre the way it happens. Uh, and also, you, you usually, you know, almost always, I've had times where serious things have gone wrong in the business, uh, and I've found out three hours later but I've gotten my three MITs done and that day has been a win. So I've, I've made the day a win and then I found out about the fire and then I just solved the fire then. It, you know, it's three hours, your day's a win, you've locked in your, your gains, you've locked in your progress and then you can deal with, you know, whatever kind of chaos is going on after that point. So, you know, a big reason people don't do that is because they have this belief that they need to check their phone, they need to check email, they need to check in with things, they need to make sure nothing's gone wrong. We really advocate against that and I would just, you know, suggest that you even try it for a month or even a week, and you'll see that the performance gains far outweigh the tiny drawback of not being able to, you know, sync with people that early. And again, you know, you may have, for example, you may have one of your most important tasks be to sync with all your employees or your downline or things like that. So that's different. We're talking about distraction that isn't relevant for those most important tasks. Um, so just to recap on that, number one within your paradigm or within your flow hacking protocol is minimizing cognitive load and two ways to handle this. Number one is automation, uh, which is making every single step between waking and your most important tasks predetermined and set and forget. Number two is distraction management, protecting your attention from anything that is coming in at you, whether it's email, phone, news, etc. Even Even other people, you know, if, if you've got a spouse, and they need to talk to you about things, tell them that it needs to wait until lunchtime. You know, you, the last thing you want to do is have a talk about morning or uh, mortgage payments or, or, you know, some big issue that's happening in the family before you do your most important tasks. It's going to hire cognitive load. You're going to have that thing in your mind going on the whole way through your most important tasks. It's going to block you from getting into flow. So even when I used to, uh, I was back in Ireland for a little while, and I was living back in my family home for about a month recently. And as politely as I could be, I would tell my mom that I just couldn't speak to her until, you know, lunchtime because she would come in, she'd start asking me about, you know, plans for the weekend and every single one of those thoughts are going to eat away at the amount of effort, mental effort and horsepower you have to allocate towards the things you're actually trying to do. So you've got to be anal about that sort of stuff and way, 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 way overestimate in comparison to your average people, average person, how much your attention can be fractured. Um, because people hugely underestimate that people, you know, the people value money heavily, but they way undervalue attention. You know, people don't throw away money, but they throw away attention all the damn time and attention ends up becoming money. So you've got to be super careful about that. Um, so number two is going to be leveraging. Well, I just want to check in actually. Are we okay time-wise, Pebble? Or? Yes. Amazing. Okay. Super, super. 
Um, so number two is going to be leveraging the flow cycle. And I know there's a ton of information that we're going through today, but thanks for bearing with me. So a common misconception about flow is that the state works like a light switch, that it's either on or off, that you're either in flow or you're not in flow. But the reality is the flow is actually not binary. Flow actually takes place across a spectrum, first of all. So you can be in a deep flow state or a very light flow state. And then also flow takes part or takes place within a cycle, four part cycle. And only one part of that cycle is flow. And this is research done by a cardiologist at Harvard called Herbert Benson. Um, and so there are four phases to the flow cycle. The first one is struggle. The second one is release. The third one is flow. And the fourth one is recovery. And the flow state itself is only the third phase in this four part cycle. Um, and so what we want to talk about here is the struggle phase. And again, please, as I'm describing this, try and relay it back to your own personal experience, because the struggle uh, phase happens at the start of the flow cycle. So what happens all the time is you will sit down to do some highly focused, high priority work. And you'll find yourself having this extreme desire to get up, do something else, check email, get a snack, do anything but the work that you're supposed to be doing in front of you. And the desire to procrastinate, the desire to get up and get out and do something else is extremely intense and overwhelming. And where the vast, 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 vast majority of people go wrong is they give in to that desire. After about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes of struggling through, you know, the trying to focus and they spend their entire working lives in that struggle phase. So they sit down, they do 10, 15, 20 minutes of work. The pain gets too much. They get up and they go, they distract themselves. They come back, they sit down, they do 10, 15, 20 minutes of painful work. Then the pain comes too much. They get up, they go, they do something else because they're distracted and uncomfortable. Um, and the massive issue here that people don't realize is that, they are actually sabotaging their ability to get into flow because after the struggle phase is the release phase and you break into the flow state. So most people are spending their working lives go working right up until they would release and get into flow and then distract themselves and bring themselves back down to the start. And then they struggle, struggle, struggle. And just before they would get into flow, they get up, they distract themselves, et cetera, et cetera. And they spend their entire lives, working lives in the struggle phase. But what you have to do is you have to persist through the struggle phase into the release phase. And the release phase is kind of when the click happens and then you break into a flow state and you will know that this, this happens all the damn time. So if you, if you try it now tomorrow, and this is the simple takeaway is when you're sitting down to work, persist, 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 do not let yourself be distracted. And then you will without fail break into a flow state and then from you're off. It's like takeoff. It's effortless. Things have disappeared. You're loving it and you're fine. But the key is to not get up or distract yourself before the struggle phase is over and you're, you're, you're into release. Otherwise you're kind of like resetting the whole thing constantly. Um, and if you do that, it's just a disaster. Work is horrible. But the beauty of it is that after a little while, and now even that I've kind of told you this, you'll be more aware of it. But after a little while, you start to persist through the struggle phase. You realize that on the other side of that struggle, five, 10, 20 minutes is flow. And you then become accustomed to the fact that, oh, this is just the normal feeling that I get before flow. Uh, and then it becomes easy and it becomes fine. And you're able to just keep going. And over time, you get better and better at that. And you just know that that feeling and that desire to procrastinate and do something else is just the feeling that comes up before you get into a flow state. So that's leveraging the flow cycle, just being aware of the fact that there is a struggle phase before flow and you have to persist through it in order to be able to get into flow. And if you do not persist through it, you're going to reset your system and you're going to go back to square one and you're going to have to start again. Uh, and you do not want to do that. Um, so that's, that's going to be step two in the paradigm ritual when we're, and this applies by the way, to doing your MITs, you know, so you're doing your MITs, you get your phone off, you're fully focused. You've got everything lined up in your computer, your clear goals, you're sitting down, you're focusing, it will start to feel uncomfortable. You'll start to want to just check Instagram once or talk to someone in your house or whatever. You have to just persist and you will break through the flow. Uh, so that's step two. Step three, uh, which we're going to touch on super quickly here, and then that's going to be a wrap, 
is going to be minimizing attention residue. And this relates sort of back to number one, cognitive load, but slightly different. So attention residue is an idea that came from a professor at the University of Minnesota called Sophie Leroy. And she identified a problem in her research, which is that when you switch from some task, let's just say, you know, MIT one or whatever your first most important task is to MIT two, which is whatever your second most important task is, your attention does not immediately follow. A residue or a percentage of your attention actually remains stuck thinking about the original task. So for example, let's say you're, M you're working on MIT one with 100% attention and you just jump into MIT two for 10 minutes and you're thinking is, you know, these are both my most important tasks for the day that it's both it's all high priority work. It's all super important. How much harm could that do? The reality is that when you jump back in to finish MIT one, you are going to have less attention to be able to devote to it because a certain amount of your attention is going to actually be consumed by MIT two or whatever other task you jumped into. So the point here is actually just that you need to complete tasks sequentially one after another. You should not task switch, even if the task you're switching into is also a really high priority, super important task. You've got to go one, two, three after another, knocking each one out so that you have full attention on each one. You can drop it all mentally and you start number two. If you bounce between them, you're fracturing your attention, you're heightening your cognitive load, and you're decreasing your ability to get into flow and to fully focus. And then one super simple, important point here, because as I've said, you know, the way I recommend doing this whole practice is as ideally, you know, kind of like a four hour block or three hour block um, from waking up in the morning all the way through to completing all three of your MITs ideally. And then you can sort of start the more reactive busy work stuff of the day of checking phone, responding to email, getting back to people, et cetera. Um, but, during that three to four hour block, you can take a break. You do not need to stay, you know, fully focused the entire way through. There is a balance here. So you can take a break. Um, but the key is that the break is not cognitively stimulating. So if you take a break um, and that break is, you know, more sort of stimulating cognitively than the task that you are doing. So for example, if your break involves scrolling an Instagram feed or watching a YouTube video or having a phone call, you're actually going to, again, push yourself back to the start of the struggle phase. You're going to increase cognitive load and you're going to kind of shatter your whole flow state. So you need to take a break that is cognitively boring or unstimulating and that break is just like it's just like a little mental reset you can literally sit and stare at the wall for 10 minutes if you want to and just close your eyes you can just go for a walk you can stretch get a glass of water you can meditate but do not do anything that's stimulating or again you're going to kind of you're going to uh, heighten cognitive load you're going to reset the struggle phase back to the start um, and you're going to increase attention residue so your break throughout this whole process has to be something that is super simple uh, and that is not stimulating at all. And that's gonna allow you to maintain the flow state the whole time. And it's gonna allow you to take 10 minutes to recover a little bit and then come back and get straight back into flow without having to reset things. So just to recap on that, that last piece then, uh, your, your flow hacking protocol is gonna be number one, minimizing cognitive load, number two, minimizing attempt sorry number two leveraging the flow cycle and pushing through the struggle phase number three minimizing attention residue so that is the um the paradigm ritual the flow hacking protocol hope that's helpful to you guys um and yeah that's kind of a wrap on that okay bye. so big Rian, that was that was amazing brother 